This Friday on Horse Racing Journeys, we will have a special edition discussing the Caribbean Horse Racing High Performance Center with the Honorable Minister Corey Lang, Dr. Marsha Hines Myrie, Leroy Trotman, Carlos Grant, Kirk Hammond, and Sean Hall as our panel guests. We will learn about the new exciting direction to develop horse people for the international market. Away Together is all about enhancing the guest experience from the hotel to exploring everything the destination has to offer. Away Together brings the culture and the history of a location alive to the traveler who is seeking to immerse themselves in a truly authentic local experience while on vacation. Journeys is sponsored by the Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association of Ontario, which represents thoroughbred owners and trainers and their hardworking employees at Woodbine and Fort Erie racetracks. The HPPA represents horse people's interests in all issues pertaining to thoroughbred racing. The HPPA's goal is for the betterment of racing at all levels, from medical and pension plans to negotiating with government and racetrack operators. Your HBPA is at the forefront of all issues important to members. Please visit the HBPA at hbpa.on.ca or on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thank you, HBPA Ontario. The next race day at the Garza Savannah will be the 30th of April. Bring your family and enjoy a day of racing. Hey, oh, what's going on, buddy? Hi, how are you doing, boss? Well, doing pretty good, doing pretty good. I must congratulate you, um, you know, for back to win his first race in Halston Park. Thank you, thank you. you who, know, was nice. who, who was the trainer? Mark Cassie. Mark Cassie. Well, yeah, wow. one, of his, one of his biggest supporters too, right? Yeah. I mean, you can only continue to thank that man for, you know, right. not just doing things for Pacha, but doing things for a lot of Barbadians, I should say. You know what I yes. mean? Yes. And, and something yes. that, you know, this show is all about here tonight too, right? right. So, right. but I mean, hey, and then he also has the support of Safi Joseph up here too. So we've been getting a lot of support from those two guys. He's actually writing um, one tomorrow and, and on Friday, he's going to be running next week, Friday. He's going to write three on next Friday also. Today, it was for Friday. Okay. So he'll be on Friday, you know, so yeah, okay. so. That's one tomorrow, one Saturday, and and yeah, so much Saturday and one Sunday. Right. So you yeah. know, we're giving some support and getting themselves in shape at the same time and making some money doing it. But you know, yeah. it's good for me too to get exposed down here and learn, you know, the yeah. Yeah. Young culture down here too, which is helping me a lot. So you know, able to venture out and making things right. You know what I mean? So right. again, I'm kind of excited about this show we got tonight you know what i mean something that you guys been trying to do for a long time so this is something we've been working on for i would say 11 years now when i first met marcia heinz myrie and um this was a project where she, when i first met her she told me that guys like myself come back to barbados and we don't get back to the country that's how it all started and um at the time I wasn't involved in horse racing in Barbados. I never planned to because I I I, I knew how Barbados is, and I it wasn't part of my life again to to go that route again in my life. But after speaking to Marsha, 
I told her I would speak to John Jones. Three of us sat down for months to come up with a plan to have a horse racing academy. And from there, we, you know, when she finished the document, she, which she did, because uh, Marsha, as you know, she, at that time she had a PhD. She wasn't Dr. Marsha Hines Lane at the time. She had a PhD. And she did everything that what you see is ready, you know, that we took before government to talk about, along with the input of John o. Jones and myself. Okay, so Marsha have a lot to say to us about what that, but I mean, at the same time, you have guests on the show like myself and Carlos Grant, which has done a lot of good for himself oh, right. in, in Canada, and you got Kurt, which is, you know, me, I, I think really highly of that guy, meeting him not for a very long time, but you know, me, I, I think, you know, very smart horseman and well spoken guy, and I think he have a lot to add to it too. And then you yeah. have the minister also. The minister at the time, I, John o. Jones took me to St. Andrew to meet the minister back in about 2014. That was very early in the game, because John, and that's just, there were nobody else other than him who was doing the writing school stuff. And he did that, and we went down there, we talked to him, we talked to the kids, and I kept close, very close to, to Minister Lane throughout the years. I mean, throughout the years. I'm talking about 11 years now, so I was have to say at least eight of those years I spoke to Mr. Minister Corey Lane. To the point now he's on our Minister of Government and um, he advised me to go to this meeting last, a few couple of weeks ago, Wednesday, and out of the meeting, you know what I mean, we seem to have impressed the minister with what, you know what I mean, what we have to offer. I mean, it's all about bet to better Barbadians. I mean, to prepare people for a market that's completely foreign to what we do here, international market. All you guys have done it before. Um, that's why you're here now, because I want to try to draw a comparison from you, Leroy, and Carlos. When you first came to Canada, both of you guys came on the program with Grooms. Now you're the top, one of the top agents in Canada. And Carlos is a trainer who owns string, uh, about 20 horses and also runs a farm. So I just want to show youngsters that you could come to Canada starting at one level. You're coming at one entry level, but that doesn't mean you stay that way. You know what I mean? You grow, you evolve. Things happen. And a lot of good things can happen to you when you come to Canada. So the show tonight is about developing, developing and, and, and showcasing what, you know, things are helping you to showcase yourself in the right way. And when, I just want to pivot back a little bit to the, when you mentioned about the market, a market right now in Canada is desperate in need of a lot of help from when I say help grooms, exercise riders and so on. So that being said, we're eight minutes into starting the show already and we have, you know, our guests at the back waiting. And let's not keep them waiting anymore because there's so much to say and so much that we want to you know, cover. So yeah, so let's 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 take this time to just bring our guests on and hammer, you know, to do the the honors of bringing our guests to the to the front side, please. Sean, do the honor, Sean. Yes, yes. Well, down below we have Carlos Grant, Woodbine Bears trainer. To the right is Mark, Dr. Marsha Hines Myrie. She's the architect. She's the, without her, this would not be happening. Um, and to the top right is Kirk Hamlin, Barbadian based trainer. And hey, good night, good night, good night, everybody. Yes, my guy, Leroy Trotter, co host. He's the, one of the best horse agents right now at Woodbine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a lot of pressure you're putting on me, Sean, but hey. Yes. You know, I can handle it anyhow. So, um, you're saying that without Marsha, this was, oh, Marcia, was not I possible, Sean. Yeah, the ministers, he, he's going to join us, but let's start with Marsha. Marsha, you started, you came, you met me before you even said good night properly to me. You were all over me <laughs> and you were destroying me, telling me that guys that like myself come back to Barbados, we don't give back to the country. You know, you had me, I must admit, I, I felt it was a very low 
point in my life when a lady tells me that, you know, maybe I, I started to look at myself differently, you know. <laughs> but it worked though, because I mean, through 10 years, 11 years have gone and I kept fighting for this. I mean, you, you keep telling me that I'm brave to keep fighting for this. I mean, I've spoken to so many people over the years, but four or five different ministers of sports. Mm -hmm. I spoke to um, Prime Minister, um, Honorable Mia Motley, um, ministers in foreign affairs, ministers in labor. So you're the body though who really put pen to paper to write this. You sat down with us. Tell us what, what this is all about. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. Good night, um, everyone. Um, you say that I'm the architect. Well, I never ride a horse. And if I didn't have the input of yourself and Jono, there was nothing for me to write. Um, but I think what it is, and I think it's kind of important to, you know, start this show in this way, is that there are some of us who have the gift of brightness, and there are some of us who have the gift of horse racing, right? And if we are going to move Barbados forward, what we need to realize is that these divisions that we create between ourselves, those of us who may be book bright, those of us who may be able to ride a horse, groom a horse, shoe a horse, we need to break down those divisions. And all of us need to come to the national table and be able to work together to move our country forward. And I don't know if I was the architect as much as that, you know, we created space for that. So I saw something in, in the experience that yourself and John O had, right? And I will say that all of this uh, conversation that we were having, so the West Indies Cricket High Performance Center started before me. I don't, I don't want to take glory that is not mine, but what I was is the first curriculum specialist in the West Indies Cricket High Performance Center. So this work around um, pairing uh, training programs with academic elements and sport elements together to create certification, uh, this is not my, my, my first go at it, right? And I think what working in the West Indies High Performance Center at that time has given me is a clear picture of the successes of that program and what worked but also kind of, you know, some of the ways that that program could have been fortified, because I don't think that it, it is a secret that the program no longer exists. So what we have been able to do with the Caribbean Horse Racing High Performance Center is that we have been able to learn from the errors of the past, um, but also to, you know, um, lean on a lot of, of the work that I would have done in developing a curriculum for, for that particular initiative and to bring it to the second most popular sport in Barbados, right? So we, we know what has happened to cricket. We won't tell that story now, but I think that uh, there's a way in which horse racing has captured a lot of the national imagination that cricket has kind of um, uh, left open. Uh, for for the taking. A lot of young people in Barbados are now very involved with and infatuated by the sport of horse racing. And to connect it to what Leroy was saying, you have that happening in Barbados, and then you have a jurisdiction like Canada that is thirsty for horse racing professionals. You also have a kind of legacy, um, a successful legacy of Barbadian horse people in Canada. So you have, as we just mentioned, the Patrick husbands, but we also have a number of people who have made their names kind of behind the scenes. So you have Kirk here, you have Carlos here, um, you know, Wayne Boy, a whole set of people, a whole generations of, of horse people who have gone to Woodbine and have made their names not only as jockeys, but also as grooms and exercise riders. So there is a whole, a whole industry for us to tap into. And I, I think that's what we're trying to do with the CHR HBC. Mm. Well, right. Well, um, Carlos. Yes, sir. You are on the grounds at Woodbine right now. Can you add to more what Dr. Hines Myrie just said? Yes, good night to all. Well, I'm on the grounds and we are desperately in need of help. Mm -hmm. we, I have 26 horses in training and I could only afford to bring in 21 right now wow. because I got three grooms 
Wow. Plus myself and one of my grooms, she only worked five days a week. So I got a sling groom four days for the other two guys when they're off. And then on the morning when I go in, all of us get together and we mark all 21 stalls. We got to get them done before 515 to prepare wow. the horses to, for training, right? I get here at three o'clock. I put in my breakfast. I do what I have to do, medications, check all of my horses, everything. And then we start to work. We work as a team. Mm -hmm. Then we finish all the stalls. Then each individual groom go to their horses and we start. I got two grooms there right now. Groom is seven horses. My my swing groom, he went away. So these two grooms decide they're going to stay on with me seven days. I'm seven days. You know? And it, it's very hard. So we definitely need some sort of relief, some sort of help we need. And it, it, it really hurt us that we can't bring in any help. And it's so tough to get help coming in with the criteria and things that the Canadian government is asking. You know, it, it is really, really tough. But we definitely need help here. We definitely. So do you think then once we get something like this started and it's more structured that we might be, be taken more seriously? Um, yes, of course, of course. Well, we will. Be, you will be taken more seriously because I am a guy. I'll be standing behind you guys to help push this organization. We all the same thing, right? You really need it. Mm -hmm. You know, I I have owners behind me that I could get them involved to to help push this program, right? Because we really need the help here. You know, we got good horse people in the Caribbean, not only Barbados, the whole of the Caribbean right. have really good horse people, Papa de Lund, that want to do this. Yep. And as you know, Sean, this is an industry, you got to love this to be in it. You know, sure. when, when, when we get enough to go work, people has been out coming home from partying. Correct. Yeah. You understand? So this, this is something you got to love and, and enjoy it and be in it. You know, as my mom said, two places you got to be happy is your home and your job. Correct. If you're happy in them two places, you know, you got to change it. But right. for me, getting more riders up here, getting more grooms, it will ease the situation. And on top of it, you know, I, I, for me as a trainer, and I'm speaking on behalf of other trainers, if we was to ever get more foreign workers coming to Canada, You'll be surprised to see more stores that would be being filled because oh, yeah. you will start getting the Canadian, the American trainers coming back over. Yes. Right? We have a very long season. We don't have okay. to go like in the tracks to go other places. We in <laughs> one spot. And the purses are lucrative. Very, very good purses. Mm -hmm. Even with the exchange rate, it's still worth it, right? So you get we get this program going and we manage to get in. More workers, grooms, hot walkers, exercise riders, and we get them here. What about you? Definitely take off again. You will get more American trainers coming because, therefore, they'll be able to bring the help from America and get in here, right? We are established as one of the top tracks in North America, and with more help, we could be actually nearly the top, right? Mm -hmm. And I find now. As Leroy will tell you, I find we are generating now a lot of foreign riders wanting to come to Woodbine mm -hmm. because it's a better a better place for them as more structural, one spot to go to. The children will be in one school and they don't have to go here, there, and everywhere. You know, like when I first met David Moron, he told me. He ride that one track and then he got to go and catch a helicopter to go to another track to ride, ride in a race for 2,000 pounds. Yeah. Right? That's wow. to make ends meet. Wow. So uh, it was a blessing that he got here. Caroline yes. Costigan bought him up and he made his way here. Right? And I find a lot a lot more riders trying to get into what by which in. I agree with him. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's more stability here. Right? And if I could whatever you can do to help get some more guys up here, get foreign workers, guys from the Caribbean that really love this industry and 
as I tell you, your, your, your heart got to be in it. It's got to be something you love. You just can't bring a person off of the road. It's not like giving a person a boom to super gutter. Correct. You know, it's not like picking up trash. It's not like putting meal in a mailbox. These is live animals you're dealing with. And you got to love them. You, you, your heart got to be in it. You know, it's, it's, it's long hours, it's early mornings, it's late nights, you know, and not now, but Leroy and Sean and Noel, where we had Greenwood, we were strapped back in the 80, late 80s, early 90s. Yes. You know, I we go to Greenwood, we are strapped. We get down there for night racing. It start at seven. And if you're in the last race, you're yes. catching, you got to wait on the last trailer that coming back to uh, Woodbine for two in the morning. Yeah, then yeah. when you get back to Woodbine, <clears throat> excuse me, two in the morning, you got to do your horse. And if you have a horse running in the first race Friday, you got to catch that first van back down for seven o'clock. So yeah. between getting home at two, you get bed about 3.30, by four, 4.30, you're back up, you get up, all your work finished, get your horse ready to head back to Greenwood. Right, and th this is something that no normal person that is not in horse racing would not understand. Yeah, right. It's only people that in this industry love that love it, it. love it, that yeah, would understand it. And one thing I could tell you about goons from Barbados, they don't care how much money you pay them as long as there could be with a horse. Yeah, it's dear love. Yeah. You could pay them five dollars, they're not leaving. You know what? That is their thrill and their excitement. It's you a know? passion. We got a passion. Their passion. They, they love it. And yeah. I, as a trainer, I, I came, I came here back in late 89, 1991. I was about 17. And I learned from a trainer called Jake Nemec. He was one of the top world trip baby trainers. He was mm -hmm. kind of a character and he taught me a lot. Right? Mm -hmm. And First thing he asked me, he said, Carlos, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a trainer. So then he told me, well, go after your goal. But unfortunately, the same thing that happened you now happened back then. In 91, we came back home and they finished the contract because the city Canadians wasn't getting any work. Correct. We went home for 12 years. And wow. 12 years after, we kept, we kept the hope. We, we, we keep, we just, I just keep praying. Yeah. You know, I wanted to go back in 92 and my mom took my passport. She said, you're not leaving here. You're not going in another man's country to be a prisoner. Well, Born in Barbados, you stay here. Wow. If this is for you, it will come back to you. Mm -hmm. And my trainer, I haven't talked to him. I didn't spoke to him in about 12 years, 10 years. And all of a sudden he called me and he asked me if I want to come back. I said, sure, of course. And I made my way back up to Canada in 2000. Uh -huh. and when I got back here, he introduced the groom school to me. Said, look, there's a school called the groom school. You pay 75 bucks. It's every Tuesday. Education is free. And this with 40 studies to become an assistant trainer. Then 40 studies to become a trainer. And, and after that, he also appointed, he, he brought over a valid point to me. He said, look, if you go to school, get your degree and then you become my assistant even if the immigration comes down on you and you don't have your paperwork yet at least they will see that you're in a different category than just being a groom or a hot walker that you're trying to better yourself right yeah. and he pushed me he pushed me he didn't he didn't really teach you much you gotta watch him to learn yeah and i i was like a hawk on him i watch everything he did right and it excelled me from being his assistant. Then he passed away. My wife took over. And then I become her assistant. We go, and then we had a kid. I, I took over as trainer. Mm -hmm. And I've been training from then. This is about 15 years now. Wow. And I never looked back. Mm -hmm. I became more. People started recognizing me no, more because Norm Knight, a good friend of mine, and his son, Brad, and Peter Gaskin, um, Matt Knight had a suspension and they asked me to sit in as trainer for him. So I was, my, my name was down mm -hmm. and I was the substitute trainer and I was training for 
Bruno Shigadans, very good owner and biggest horseman in you can see but actually in North America. Got, got a lot of horses. So All my right. name started to get there and people started to recognize me. Uh -huh. You know? So when I got back here and I told Peter Gaskin, I said, Peter, don't laugh, but the day that I get to go back to Canada, they have to get one of those cannons by the Hilton Hotel to blow me up because I'm not leaving. Mm -hmm. I made sure of that that I did the right thing. I listen, and the main thing you have to do up here, you gotta respect yourself. Mm -hmm. You gotta respect your elders. Mm -hmm. You gotta listen. You gotta ask questions. You know? Jake but, always tells me, say, Carlos, if you if I ask you to do something and you don't know how to do it, he said, Tell me you don't know how to do it. Do not tell me you know, and then when I expect you to know, you don't know. It makes you look very, very bad. But Carlos. I don't mean to cut you, but we have the minister in the background here, and we'd like to bring him in to get him in the conversation. Sure. Um, Hammer, bring the minister in, please. Hello. How are you doing, minister? Hi, right, good evening, everyone. Hi, good evening, Sean. Good evening, good evening. What are you doing? I, I saw you cut him off to bring me. I was enjoying what he was saying. I was really listening to Tentley making notes. As, okay, we, okay. as we interact with our youngsters <laughs> here, these are all the things they need to learn to come into yeah. the program. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt neither, but yeah. I know I don't want to keep you waiting too long. That's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, but Carlos on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so as, oh. as I was saying, yeah. so when you come up here, it, it, it's kind of a first thing you've got to do is respect yourself. Mm -hmm. Before you respect anybody, respect yourself. You gotta to listen to what people are telling you. You know the God. I I see it all the time. Not only from Bajans, I see it from a lot of Caribbean guys. You know they they, they do one thing one way, and one way, and then when they get here, you tell them to do something else. It's like you know you gotta to listen to authority. Mm. You gotta to listen to what people telling you. If you want to better yourself, it's all about learning. You know, it's a learning, learning, learning. Nobody knows all in this game. You'll die and go. And you will still be learning you know and that is where i reach where i am now and i'm still learning I carlos yes can i ask a question sure um the standard what sets the standard because you're you're speaking of learning um what set the standard as to what's right what's wrong what should be and what shouldn't be the standard is set when you show respect to people, good night, good morning, good evening. Always ask questions, be attentive, get to work on time. Never be rude to your boss, no matter what. He pays the bill, never be rude to him. The standard that I'm looking for are these guys, come and do your work, behave yourself, respect authority, respect for other workers in my barn i have i don't matter if you and tom and harry don't talk i expect when you guys are my shed total communication because you cannot go nowhere without communication that is what i have in my barn we work as a team and total communication if one guy is busy and something is to happen another guy falling if I, if I could come in here as well on that question, Leroy, because I think it's an important question, um, what sets the standard? So what we're trying to produce here is athletes that are performing at a professional level. Um, and I think that, you know, it is something that we are still coming into um, in Barbados, if we're honest, right? We are accustomed to an era where you know, you had the Sean Halls of the world, the Patrick Husbands of the world, who, if we are honest, used raw talent, right? And they were able to be successful with their raw talent. The sporting world and the sporting expectations have moved on from that a bit. And when we are sending um, athletes or horse racing professionals to Canada, there is an expectation that they will be more refined as professionals. 
And, and that's what we're trying to get to. And, and what has set the standard for that is the way that the sporting industry internationally has changed, right? So in addition to, you know, all of the things that Carlos are talking about, which is how we've made our name in, in the sporting industry in Canada in the first place, because a lot of what Carlos is talking about, respect for other people working in teams, you know, all of that is, is, is what it means to be Barbadian. So it is, it is not strange to us, right? That is, that is what we are known for around the world, wherever we travel to work. In addition to that, what we want to do is to get um, the youngsters in the program more acquainted with some of the other professional expectations. So if you are going to be performing um, as, as a professional athlete, the way that you eat um, is different. Your expectations around, you know, understanding doping and anti-doping and how to perform within those um, parameters has to be different. Um, the way you apply yourself, right? So this is your job. People come to the races to enjoy themselves, to gamble, to all of that. You come to the races in the office, right? So the more we can can um, train or or young sports people who have the talent um, into some of those other areas, the more successful they they are going to be because that is what the standard very much is in sports internationally now. All right, um, guys, I, I'm been here sitting and listening quietly to a lot of things you guys are saying. But um, before I go any further, um, we came to Canada in '89 and joined the '90s. Um, that's in Canada, but in Barbados, when we grew up around the horses, we we grew up in say the '70s, '80s, and things were so different then. Mm -hmm. to how they are now and we're living in a different world today you, you know and the youngsters today they do things different we didn't have no xbox we didn't have no playstation we had scooters that we had to make for ourselves you know you got fancy cars now you got you know TikTok. you got facebook you got all these things and why i'm trying to say these things in that term is that we have to look at things differently now. Yeah, we have to have respect. No, no doubt about that. We have to, you know, respect our elders. We have to come to the workplace and do the job that we're asked to do. But at the same time, now we're trying to, to take youngsters, not just in Barbados, but in the Caribbean, and bring them to North America and expose them to what North America is bringing in the horse terms of North America. In Barbados, terms of training and resources are different. Uh, we produce a lot of jockeys in Barbados. But now we're producing a lot. People are realizing that we produce a lot of great horsemen from Barbados. Now, I want to go back to the youngsters now and in today's world now. We, our approach to trying to teach these youngsters the way we were brought up, it's, it has to be done differently. And differently in the way that these youngsters, you know, Getting up at four o'clock in the morning is not everybody's cup of tea. Working long hours is not everybody's cup of tea. And asking a lot of youngsters today to do that is not going to be easy. And, and I want to be realistic about this because that's one of the reasons why now today in, I, let me just speak for Canada, I can't speak for America, although that's where I'm right now because they have a lot of Spanish guys in the game here doing the job over here. But to bring a lot of action, a lot of Canadians to come and do this job, and I witness it for myself when they come in and they see that the hours they have to get up and what they have to do is like they work two days and they're out of there. Now, you want to take youngsters now to do the same thing with, and we got to break them into this. And like we always, the old people say, you know, bend the tree while it's young. So we got to remember that this is not going to be an easy task doing this with young people. It's something well, that we have to really, really look at in a very good way. So we got to make sure we come about this and go about this in the right way. And how many youngsters, Kurt, I'm going to let you speak for a minute. Just give me one more minute, please. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of youngsters now, um, how many youngsters have that relationship with one another or with elders in Barbados around the racetrack to teach them what we were taught? You know, so I'm just looking at it like that. 
because I can talk about what I where I started, how I started, what I went through, and where I am today. Yes, I can do that, but we still have to look at this and make sure that we understand this. And guys that are going to be around these youngsters, understanding them and be able to cope with what they're going to get before they can make that change. Kurt, you can go ahead. Well, one of the things that Carlos was saying is that you have to put your heart into it. Now, 90% of this is for the love of the horse. That's the first thing. 90% of it is for the love of the horse. The other 10% is chasing glory. And from my professional perspective, I've seen where a groom come to work with me and he does thing based he does things based on how or what he was taught at another barn. We all dealing with horses, but you may find that you have a sensitive trainer who um for whatever reason lost a horse to a wheelbarrow and he does not want a wheelbarrow inside the shed or you know certain practices so right. what is interesting or why i ask the question as what the standard is is that in canada i perceive the notion to be oh he's from barbados so he's got to be a good horseman or he's from jamaica he's got to be a good horseman simply because where they came from and having an institution where you are taught the correct principles and practices around horses you set a, a higher president not only coming from barbados but you've graduated from an environment a school of grooming a school of training a school of horse understanding because at the end of the day that that's all it is so that's so where that, we're going with that question. No, no, and I, and I totally agree with you 100%, but I just wanted to understand the, the the footprint that we have to start off with in this, understand, because what Carlos has said is, I'm not just disputing nothing that he said, talked about the respect and stuff like that, but I just want to understand that when we're going to start this program off, the youngsters that you're going to have, we have to learn to cope with what is going to come to the table first thing before we can turn them into what we're expecting them to be and to bring them here with that class to showcase what they're capable of doing. That's what I'm saying. We have to be ready and prepared. So we can talk, I can sit down here like Carlos is sitting down and say, we came here and we had to respect this and we have to respect that. But I, I this is the, the, the baby steps we have to take before because the starting of it is the it is what we're talking about, not the be not the finish. Not the finish, correct. You understand? We, me and Carlos are at the finishing point of it, although we're still learning. We started then in that era where we had, you know, the guys that we had around us that we had to have the respect for and and taught us what who we are today. And we were able to take that because Carlos had a great guy called Jake Nemet. One of the great guys I had was, you know, Mr. Reed Baker that taught me the business side of the game because I went before him understanding the horse side very good, but I didn't have a clue about the business side of the game. You know what I mean? Because you will hear a young to say, oh, that train is making a lot of money. You should be able to pay me this or you should be able to pay me that. Not understanding that when that horse wins, the 60% that has to come out of the win, the, the, the 100,000, the the 10% that has to go to the owners, the 10% that has to go to the jockey, the the, the vet fees, the, the food and all that before he can say, oh, I got this from my pocket and I can give my groom X amount. All those things that have to be taught and understanding it because, you know, everybody we we grew up we grew up you could have give us nothing like carlos said but because of our love of the game you can't take a youngster today and do that way so that's why i'm trying to get to that beginning part that those baby steps outside of the game everybody's on, on the same page as me and yeah, understand what you're trying, trying totally to understand understand. Mm -hmm. understand so that's what i'm saying go ahead sean no, is the minister there yeah, I'm here, Sean. By trying to get to a quieter area, so y'all continue. I am taking in what everybody's saying, and I have a lot to say as well. <laughs> okay, no problem. I just want to make sure you're hearing us and, and you're saying, Marsha, can you expand more on the program so people can understand exactly what we plan to do, what we are aiming for, you know, all those kind of good stuff? Sure. So picking up from the, the conversation um, that you were just having, um, 
we, again, from Barbados, we have a particular image in our head of, of what a child is or what somebody in education is. Um, and that has changed significantly around the world. So in Barbados, we still measure our educational system again by those individuals who are book bright and not only book bright, but you gotta go to Harrison College and Queens College and possibly Commamere gets an honorary mention. And if you haven't done that, you haven't succeeded, right? The world has moved on from that. Even, even at the level of the university, um, the way that learners come to us and the way that we interact with the learners has changed. It has changed. We understand what we now call neurodivergency. We understand giftedness. We understand how to work beyond, you know, just individuals who have that but competence, who, who can sit and be quiet and do self-directed learning and that kind of thing. And so in terms of, of meeting people where they are, Leroy, and taking them to the next level, that's exactly where a program like this comes in, right? Yeah. We are not um, employing necessarily traditional modalities, but what we want to do is to come up with a basic core of things that a successful professional must know. A successful professional must know how to present themselves for the camera um, and for interviews. So we're going to do that. A successful in, uh, professional must know how to manage money. And one of the things that is, um, you know, a characteristic of a, of a high performance um, uh, career is that it is very finite time wise, right? Um, except when you're a Patrick Husbands, you just keep doing it over and over and over and over. But for many other high performance athletes, there is a finite time. You work for 10 years, you work for 15 years, and then after that, you know, you manage the, the money that you have been able to make. So understanding the business of your sport is important. High performance um, has to do with body conditioning and mind conditioning. And so our program is going to address uh, those two aspects, right? Um, to carry on the legacy of being a Barbados horse racing professional, you have to understand that legacy, right? There are a lot of, of, of young horse people in Barbados. They love horses. Um, you know, they're doing all the things that we're talking about here. They can go into a barn. They can work in a group. But they don't necessarily understand what ties them to a Leroy, what ties them to a Carlos, what ties them to a, 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 Je a, a, Jeff, a Godfrey Griffith. They, 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 they don't understand that. And so to be able to carry on that legacy in a very clear way, we have to let uh, these young people know how they're connected to that legacy. And we have to do it in ways that match their, their learning styles. And so that's what we want to do. Um, I, you know, one of the things that, that I've specialized in over the years is teaching divergent learners. So I'm, I'm certified, qualified to teach divergent learners. So this is not going to be any program where, you know, we're expecting anybody to come and and write any long exam about horse racing or anything. We want um, to use experiential learning. We want to make sure that that when they come away, they, they, they are not only talking about these skills, but they can demonstrate these skills. And most importantly, we want to be able to offer some level of certification, right? Because again, we're not only um, preparing these young uh, Barbadians for their high performance career, but we're preparing them for a lifetime. And so after their high performance career, how do they, they move to the, the next phase of being a, a, um, a you know, booking agent like you are, Leroy, or mm -hmm. you know, just making sure that they have the competency so that beyond the high performance career, they can also tap into some of the other options that are available post that career. So I think that gives a kind of um, overview of the program um, and how we have approached putting it together. Yes, Minister, I don't. I don't want to scare. I don't want to scare these youngsters off and think that you know we're we're going to be a, a yeah. they're going to be drill sergeants out there to no, scare them no. off because <laughs> they need, you know we need to baby them and, and and tamper them a little bit before we can you know what I mean because absolutely a, it's a long way to go from 
from where from starting. So Sean, mm -hmm. go ahead, Sean. Yeah, the minister's here now. So can can we have an input from you, sir? Of course. Um, I've been listening, um, not from the exact beginning, but I got an idea of what everyone is saying. Just to jump in, my, my thing is I want to... Mm -hmm. So I'll, yeah. I'll go with her? Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh. I'll, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to say that I hope this don't get me kicked off the program, right? Uh, when, <laughs> when, when, when people think about what we're doing in this program, the main thing isn't about the actual horse racing. The main thing is really creating a well rounded human being citizen to be able to contribute and that's what i've been trying to do so i, I know sean would have mentioned the work i've been doing i mean party program in nature Farm ranch it went 26 years it will go 26 years in about two months right and i had to explain to people a lot it's not a horse program it is not agricultural program it's really a program that seeks to look at the youth development using these things as a means to end what they are passionate about to get to a means to end now, mm -hmm. I don't want to go through the full history of it. It's a long history. We started, was doing it for a while. Obviously, we had a couple of breakdown horses, little $300 horses here and there, you know, <laughs> because the, the young people are very passionate about it. And that's how you really get to the platform, to get to the part where you do that kind of development, because you're capturing their imagination, their passion, and so on. That's how they get up at 3 o'clock. That's how they get up at 4 o'clock. Now, mm -hmm. someone mentioned early before, we got to bring them up different. I, I, I would like to say that a little differently. I think we got to we gotta start bringing them up again. A lot of people don't have that type of brought up See that we talk about. Some are either dragged up or they're not brought up at all. A lot of them raise themselves. And that is why they get involved in these type of programs. We find that they have a lot of difficulties. And what is the standard? Who sets the standard? That changes with time and environment. But if I the matter, there's some fundamental basics that we were taught back then that took the Sean Halls and the Patrick Husbands and all them with natural talent and they'll be able to get through. It was called broad up See, It was called manners. It was called respect. It was called morals and values. And what you have now is, I am more familiar with this through the farm level program. We have a number of young persons who are sent back here on a monthly basis because of cap calling, which is known as sexual harassment overseas. In Barbados, is nothing. You do it, it's like part of the course. It's part of a culture. Every young man doesn't cap call, he'd be called a homosexual for this more. But when you go into a different environment and a different culture, and that is why the, the high performance center and this type of program that we are putting on now is so supremely important because we have to make that world-class international athlete by instilling these things in them and helping them to understand that cap calling all the different things and the drugs and the weed is a, a, a well, is natural. So in a problem, you got you got no train them up all through all those things. So that that be my first. Uh, opening salvo um, but i really think that the key to what we are doing now is really connecting the dots over the years what we've been doing the walk trot canter uh trot three laps and do two pace do two canters the, the time for that is really fast as marcia said they've got to be able to face the camera they've got to be able to manage the money they've got to be able to understand contracts they've got to understand dieting and exercise yeah. so it's really a high performance system now where you take and you create actually elite athletes in a way that we could go there and even go beyond. And not only just the jockey part of it, as we mentioned, the grooms, right. the trainers, okay. the owners, the farriers, who whatever you want to be, you mm -hmm. we not opening an avenue for them to be professionally trained and certified. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. So no. go ahead, Sean. No, you go ahead. You go ahead, Leroy. No, I I, I just want to, I wrote a list of, of guys here, names here on here, because I keep hearing jockeys all the time. And I want to stand up for the guys like myself and Carlos that started, you know, barefoot in those stalls and using a piece of cardboard to muck the stalls and throwing the, the shavings outside to dry and stuff like that. And the, glow, the jockeys get, got all the glory of it because we used to be the ones that, you know, at the end of the race day, you want to see Charlie Jones, you want to see Goffrey Griffin, you want to see all those guys, right? So the jockeys always got the glory and Sean Hall. So that's why I was picking on Sean Hall. So, right, glory because you guys, the minister and Marsha, keeps mm -hmm. talking about Patrick Husband and Sean Hall. Patrick Husband, Sean Hall. But, Sean you know, is named better, yeah. Are you getting it? I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't I heard that, I'm gonna use that because yeah, of yeah, her, yeah, but go you ahead. Know, you. So, I'm, I'm gonna throw a few punches <laughs> here. I'm gonna just throw a few me. punches here. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm gonna call Carlos. I'm representing, okay. You, it's okay. Well, I, I, I'm very, very happy representing. <laughs> I, I, I'm in your corner, Roy. I'm in your corner. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to call some names here. Rodney Barrow, Randy mm -hmm. Thompson, Ryan Jones, Desmond Maynard, Renee Colafon, Nigel Burke, Devon Gittins, Ricardo um, Legal, um, Ronaldo Holder, 
Ted Holder, Nathan Squires, Carlos Grad, um, Ro uh, Roger Brooms, um, Brian, Brian uh, Allen, Ricardo Lopez, Ricky Brown, um, Brent Harris, David, um, David Adams, um, Jeff Gill, Sterling, um, Ricard Ricardo Sterling, sorry, Jamel Watson, Chris Seeley. Um, let me go further down. So those guys that I call guys, majority of those guys came to Canada as grooms. Correct. As grooms. Listen carefully. As grooms. And the, I say 85% of them that I call now are either trainers, working mm -hmm. the gate, controlling the gate, jockey, I mean, assistant trainers and top assistant trainers mm -hmm. and owners, owners and owners. Mm -hmm. Okay, remember they came here as groom, as, as an exercise writer or a groom, mm -hmm. and doing the things that we used to do. So I want to give them a little bit of glory, and those guys has done something for themselves and for our racing industry, not being just Barbadian, but um, in Canada, and as I established and done something outstanding, and they don't get enough recognition. And I want to, I'm speaking of this because I want to encourage those youngsters that you guys are trying to get into this academy to understand what these guys have done. And some of these trainers have won stake races and they're also on their own horses also. And they travel. I mean, Rand, Randy, for instance, I've traveled to Dubai last year. Was it last year? Year before. Year before, yeah. traveled to Dubai. Yeah. And, and he did it for um, Safi Joseph, the, the big trainer. I don't want to mention Safi Joseph and Michael Stowe because that's who everybody talks about. So yeah. I want to talk about the little guy. And I can put myself in here, but you know what? I'm going to sit in the background. I don't want to take no glory either way from these guys, to shine away from these guys. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? So for, for a bit, um, you know, let's give these guys a little bit of glory to understand what our horsemen from Barbados is capable of doing and accomplishing. That's what I want to put in there. Absolutely. No, but for my idea is right. The reason why we want to continue is because of the success of those guys. I mean, these guys are the reason why something like this has to happen. You know what I mean? And they most all of them might have done it the hard way. We're not finding an easier way to so people will be accepted faster, quicker, or all those good kind of stuff going forward but me, 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 mr speaker sir i want to make a point <laughs> i want leroy to, uh, to, to play about the record and see in the end i say it's not only body jockey i mentioned no 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 everybody so that's i just want to put that point over here over to you no, Marcia. No. sorry I, no that's okay i just want to say if if i have been focusing on 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 the jockeys um it is because with a program like this so this is this is where we get really real now right yes, yes. like six of us are sitting here we're talking about this idea and we're talking about wanting to do it at the same time we know and we understand that barbados um is facing its economic challenges um you know we have a lot of things in barbados that need money and we have a little bit of money so let's let's be realistic right yeah. and the reason why I may be focusing on on jockeys more than 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 any of the other um, horse people is not because it is not our a, 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 um, intention to build out opportunities for the entire uh, outfit of horse racing. That is what makes sense because Canada doesn't only need jockeys; it needs every category of horse person, and they are interested in having every category from Barbados. Yes. But here is the thing. So we talked about um, what worked and what did not with the model of, of, of the high performance center that we had that was run out of uh, the University of the West Indies and associated with cricket. I don't think that it is bringing tales out of school to say that one of the things that did not work is that there was not a sustainability model built into that program. So what was happening to train a high performance athlete is not cheap. It is not cheap. It takes a lot of overlay to get an athlete to the level that athletes are performing at in Canada. You mentioned Latin America, which also has you know, some level of legacy in relation to horse people in Canada. It's not a cheap endeavor. 
what one of the things that we want to build into this program is that we are front loading resources as a small island the same way that we do with ue right people get to go to ue and the idea is that when they're finished they will come back and they will contribute to their society if we're training jockeys to operate in canada you know and beyond because if we can move the export beyond Canada, we also want to do that. But then these individuals have to be willing to contribute back to this center so that the, the next person who is coming behind them from Valerie, from Britain's Hill, um, from, from down by um, Bayview Hospital, that they also have the opportunity to do that. And so we are going to be building into the contract a small contribution from each of those individuals. The focus is on jockeys because the, the jockeys, and I didn't make it this way, I, this is just how I come and find the industry, right? The jockeys purses are the more lucrative ones. Not, not that it means that any of the other outfit is less important, but in order to get the sustainability moving, in order to get the project proper, properly capitalized, that's why, unfortunately, we have to start with the jockey in and build outward. So I wanted to take the time to explain it just so that you know that we are not diminishing any other category. And it's not that we haven't thought of any other category, but just from the, the financial perspective, right? We have to focus on the jockey for now because that is a part of the legacy model. A little later, I'll kind of talk about how we are also hoping that the diaspora will get involved in this project and help us to be really able to resource it in the way that it needs to be resourced for it to be as effective as it can be. Okay, so that being said, I know you guys are focusing on the jockeys, but we still have to realize that, okay, and I'm going to use Sean as an, an example, that, you know, he started as a writer, but what was something that hurts Sean's career, his weight? Right. So, you, you, we, right. we got to still teach these kids that, you know, the possibility of being a jockey for a period of time could stop yeah. and you have to be able to, you know, fulfill another spot if they love this game so much. Absolutely. So we, we had a youngster on the, on the show the other night and one of the problems was his weight, but I'm not going to, you know, dwell on him about what, what his career or nothing but at the same time we have to teach these. i'm just going to use myself as an example for instance i came here as an a groom i became an assistant trainer i also uh, participate five years in a, being a, a vet assistant you, you know and i was an exercise writer in barbados too and now i'm a jockey's agent right you know so we got to make sure that these youngsters understand that their career might not they by coming to the game as a small person, as they start exercising horses, they might build muscle, might get bigger, and then their career is finished. But mm -hmm. love the game so much, we still have to teach them that they can fulfill another spot That's in the game. In, in the Absolutely. game, they can be a blacksmith. They can decide to be a trainer like Carlos, you know, himself, or so on and so on. So yes, I, I agree that you're fulfilling the spot. Of on, on jockeys is is a wonderful thing, but we still have to teach them so much more in the game and understand so much more. Mm -hmm. We agree on that. But yeah. coming in to, this, to, the, to the environment of the High Performance Center, we plan to teach you, you you're gonna be well-rounded, you'll be taught everything. I mean, you know, that's gonna come in and just concentrate on one thing, believe me, because look at myself, I, I do rehab on horses. You know what I mean? I started as an exercise writer like anybody else, but I've evolved over the years. You know what I mean? So I'm hoping once your love of horses is something I think is natural, Dolly Roy. I, 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 I sure it was a natural process for you. You know, that definitely. But I just want to, you know what I mean? I'm still representing outside the jockeys. You know what I mean? I'm still let me let me let me piggyback on everything that they said so far to kind of outline something because they actually kind of glad that Leroy uh, mentioned this. Uh, I saw Sean and Marsha share the history where they would have built out this particular program and just being where I am now in the ministry looking at crime prevention. Again, I see it as a program for youth development, also allows for crime prevention. But what Leroy is saying is absolutely correct because 
when we we look at the horse racing industry and the, we look we're looking at the horse racing academy even when we when it presented this to the ministry and we wanted to start off smaller because i give credit to the former minister of sports dwight sutherland when i first took uh marcia and sean's proposal that i had some input on to as well to to dwight what he looked at was the horse racing industry and he was looking at what are all of the professions what are all the, the things that can come from it? It went down even to the drivers of the trailers. We, we really, I think it was like 27 different positions um, that he would have extrapolated and say, how could we build out each? But obviously this has to be done in a phased approach. Yes. That approach that he was looking at was over $1.7 million startup. And that was nothing to do with the consistent cost. The startup cost was just the capital cost. And then there's the operational cost in terms of paying salaries and all that. Now, we are not saying that that investment isn't worth it, but obviously you got to do it phase by phase. The first phase that we decided to, to go with was this horse racing. No, it was a uh, jockey academy early phase with high performance. And then move into the horse race, the Caribbean yeah, horse racing phase. academy, where we actually have a facility here, high performance center here, to attract jockeys from around the Caribbean, and it could even be from around the world, because we know how it goes with climate, with weather, and all these different things. And I, I believe that the sports tourism could benefit from it. So I just want to say that we got to continue to be mindful as we build out the program that all of these things are are taught. In my one experience on on the ranch, I could tell you everybody wants to start though as a jockey. Um, that's where I just said that where the glory is, that where the camera is, and the victory. That's where it is, right? The jockeys who win the race. Not the hard, you know what I mean? That's how, that's how it was. But naturally, as Sean said, a lot of people progress into different areas. I have I have at least one girl and one guy that came to my program that are vets today that start off wanting to be jockeys. There's some mm -hmm. who are grooms, some who are trainers, some who are owners. So I think people naturally progress. Again, a lot it has a lot to do with weight. After a certain age, people can maintain that weight um that is required and they go but i do believe that something should it shouldn't just be you too heavy go and do this here it should be an actual structured program where you can actually learn the art of all these different things because i'm sure to be a trainer you need to actually have specific skills if you want to be a top class trainer because anybody could be a trainer so like, let me take this horse let me get some exercise and i hope for the best if it's a good horse and we get lucky but i believe that if we have a center looking at the horse racing academy now as opposed to a jockey academy that would include all these different possible professions. It definitely has to. It definitely has to because all of them are complementary, right? Like as you were talking about your journey, Leroy, I think you are a good horse agent because you understand exercise riding, right? Because you understand grooming, like yes. Sean the same way. Sean can rehabilitate a horse because he knows what, what it is to be on a horse, right? It, it gives you a different perspective um so i'm 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 in full agreement um at the same time you know if you're talking about high performance athleting one of the questions has to be where are the resources going to be when we talk about building sustainability for this center where are the resources going to be you can come to to canada as an exercise writer you can come as a groom and you can make enough money to provide for your family. And I'm looking at family in, in the diasporic sense. No, you can have your partner and your children in Canada, but you're also sending back something for your mommy and your auntie in Barbados. Do I want to be taking a 1% from an individual who is doing that as a groom? No. Am I comfortable to take it from someone who is, is winning races and, and getting $75,000 pots and, and whatever as they grow? Yes. So it's, it's kind of related on related questions. It's, you know, at the level of building skills and building um, uh, athletes, I'm going to teach them every possible thing that I can teach them. In terms of making this venture sustainable, in terms of making sure that, you know, if, if we have to get X amount of money from the government this year for grant funding, two years from now, we're able to reduce that by, by 10%. Five years from now, we're able to reduce that by 30%. It, it becomes a question of, you know, how do I set up the business model? That's that's not a question of training, no. That's a question of how do I set up this business model so that this high performance center does
does not become a burden to the government, right? And that's the level where, you know, because of the industry and because of, of where the money goes in the industry, that's how the focus falls on jockeys. But not at all to say that we're not going to focus on all the skills because as Minister Lane said, we're building not just a jockey, but we're building citizens and we're building people who can transition through, you know, the different stages of their careers. But by the time a person starts as a jockey and becomes maybe a horse racing agent, mm -hmm. I also am still not going to be looking at that person and saying, well, we put in money in you, so we want back, you know, 10 years later, I, I still want 1%. You know what I mean? So I'm looking at, okay, I have three years after I've produced this person to kind of tax them in a way that is reasonable. So by the time they get to a horse agent, I'm hoping that they're now willing to donate to their alma mater, like many other people do, right? There are people who support UE, there are people who support the, the universities all over Canada, that's how they make the money. So if that person still wants to have a connection with the, with the High Performance Center in that way and help us to uh, make the program stand on its own, that's great. But not that I'm coming, shaking you down, saying, well, look, use a use a, a agent no, but you went through this academy, so I want some money. You know, it's 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 a business question, is is really what it is. And that term of business, so this one is torn at the minister. Say he's the minister, and I'm torn this at just not hit the minister, the government in general, because um us as our last news, Patrick, or a jockey that's making enough money to say help sustain this academy um we make enough money yes but there's something called tax breaks and again minister this is coming at you because i like talking money and i like talking you know getting it back to i don't like it to leave my pocket too much but you know supporting things like in canada you know you can donate to, to certain things here and you can you know that goes through your taxes and stuff but you can't do that to the barbados government sending money to barbados you don't have to get that tax right out uh, what you know help can we get to be able to get something like that happening that we can donate money to these things because i, I mean if i can help in any way possible i'd love to carlos himself say that but yeah, at the same time we need that 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 tax break you know what I mean? I'm just talking business here right now. You know, you mean we talk about this school wants to teach everybody stuff. So I've learned a lot myself. How can we help here? You're on your mic. Your mic is you're, 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 you're mute. You're mute. I'm right, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just listening. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. No. You're still mute again. You're still, you're going back mute again. It's like you're automatically muted. Right. Yes. I. You. You can hear me now. Yes. Yeah. Clearly, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we're we're giving we're giving back, and and this academy is supposed to like say it works for itself. But when you have guys that get to a level and wants to do things like that, like donate stuff back to the to the academy to help it, because we're talking about giving back, and where a lot of us have been successful financially, but giving back and be able to give back, knowing that you can get a tax break. There's what what loopholes uh, and i know this is something we can speak over here but there's loopholes to get your tax break to be able to give back right the actually there was a lot of discussion around this particular thing there was some amendments and um, barbados needs to do more amendments when it comes to civil society and actually tax breaks and so on there are some other neighboring caribbean islands that has what i consider to be the best practice because the, the the ability to give back and get a lot in return for that um, is not is not at its full potential in Barbados. Let me put it that way. Yeah. A lot of people drew that to to our attention. The problem that we have, and I'll say this boldly, is that a lot of people who have this these these decisions to make throughout the Caribbean, this is a Caribbean leadership issue, have not been involved heavily in community groups, NGOs, nonprofit organizations, and they don't understand. How do I know this? Um, meeting with about two, three former prime ministers ago and uh, having the discussion with, with him, um, he had actually asked me to make a number of recommendations and then he did his own study on it and he tried to start to work on it. The bottom line is that if you don't understand the industry of phil philanthropy or uh, um, phil the, the philanthropic society and how it works and how it benefits the country, 
it's very difficult to make policy in that direction. If you're thinking in particular just taxing, borrowing, and not understanding that remittances, uh, donations, tapping into your diaspora, and all these different things can be of tremendous benefit to society. You don't have the laws or the policies or regulations in place for it. Uh, to this day, I, I'm not fully proud to say this, but I can be honest, to this day, those mechanisms are not uh, in place in any substantial way in Barbados. Let, let, let me just admit that. Um, but that is something we'll continue to, to advocate for and advocate even more strongly for because of the value that it brings to the society, not only economically, but socially. Okay. Kurt, um, you're in the corner there sitting very quietly and listen very attentively. And I know you're a very smart guy and in, in listen to what you're saying. And I want to get a little input from you since you're on this panel and I haven't heard nothing from you yet. So could you voice your opinion in whatever way possible, please? Well, this initiative is pushed all over the world. I've investigated, we're in London, we're in England, not London, England. And this initiative is pushed, but it, it mainly comes from the perspective of a struggling youngster who's flunked out of school, um, He's challenged with being a decent civil servant. And what's next? What's next? And they're pushed to these horses. Now, horses are very therapeutic. People overseas use horses to nurture children. They're children who have um, is issues with, with society. But when you come to an environment with horses where you have to, you're dealing with animal husbandry, it changes their whole perspective. So the violence, the attitude is out of the window. Um, the struggle to, the struggle to be a, a, a human being in society. Yes, and not only a human being, you flunked out of school. So there's no common mirror, there's no Harrison College to rely on. But if you have, this as an accreditation i've been to this place i've graduated from this place like for instance with me here in barbados um i have a small barn but if i get a groom from a bigger barn who has more experience he's traveled certain parts of the world i know i can rely on him for his knowledge whereas if you're accredited from this institution and you go overseas you can say straight off, um, I've been to this school, I've done this studies, I'm qualified, so I can move to work with Carlos. And working with Carlos should become easier based on the fact that I've been educated along these lines. Now, the, the African society has a saying, it takes a whole village to raise a child. Uh, what I'm trying to get at here this environment does not necessarily mean you're going to be a jockey. It leads you to, to the whole opening of being a good horseman, whether we dealing with a farrier, whether we dealing with, um, like Sean says, you have certain horses that have issues. They, 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 there's a hidden ability, but if you don't get past this issue, you can't get the best out of the horse. So you can't create the best horse for the jockey. You know, so it's very interesting. Um, I'm very, very keen to hear what government has to say, because this has to be a very, very serious push from the government side to actually develop into an institution where you can get Caribbean people coming here to learn to be good horse people. So we get to be like Leroy and Sean and, you know, you got to start somewhere. Well said. Well said. Who wants to who wants to piggyback on that? But no, definitely. I, I, I think I piggyback on it because um Sean could tell you we've been knocking at the door for a long time um with the with the proposal. But it really takes somebody that understands and care to, to really make it happen, right? Um we went through three different um ministers in one ministry um trying to get this done and it's not for lack of trying. One was very enthusiastic about it. The, the other one was even more enthusiastic about it. Um, but we had some humps and bumps. 
uh, the next one not so much doesn't really you know there's some people who specialize in certain things so they may like xyz may not like abc so then they may not have the motivation to to push for it that's why i took the opportunity when i, I had the opportunity to do it through me i didn't have to go knocking at any door i took it on as my own initiative and that is why we are here today even if in this first phase I believe that using Sean and Marsha's approach and all the information that all y'all are sharing right now, I believe that what we can do is what you call hack success, meaning that we can show success out of this first phase. And then what we can then do is encourage the government on one part, but let us not forget the philanthropic society and also the diaspora and the private sector also coming together and the jockeys themselves giving back that we can really make this a big and sustainable project. And I think that that has to be the road that we walk. But I think that we've crossed a major hurdle. Um, we've taken the first turn and the first flow. And I believe that if we continue on this particular track that we're on right now, I think that this can only be successful. What we, we're seeing is the investment of government at a particular level to get this off the ground. It needs a lot more investment. We need about four times this investment but we we gone from zero to about 25% of what we need for this this first two phases. And I think that that is a, a good start. It's better than absolutely nothing in terms of what we've gotten over the last 10 years or so. Okay, Marsha, can you see the screen? Yes, I can see the screen. And you want to read it out loud? I want you to read it out loud. I, I can read it out loud. Um, the, Alonzo says, it's good to speak of the focus on jockeys. However, without grooms, hot walkers, exercise riders, the role of the jockey would not be prominent. The grooms, hot walkers, exercise riders are vital. Um, and I agree. Yeah, no, so, I'm, not, I'm not you do that for the, the don't, I'm not throwing no punches at you. I'm just one. Oh, that's fine. And I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm, that's why we're here, right? We're yeah. here yeah. to explain um the program and to get the buy-in oh so mr minister oh i'm sorry marsh you, no, you, okay. you go for it kurt mr minister um okay so during this period we are blessed with your interest in mm -hmm. horse racing mm -hmm. um you know they say 24 hours is a long day in, po in politics mm -hmm. yeah yeah so but what works. i can advise to you is mm -hmm. that you should put something in place so if a uh, minister Corey Lane, who's interested now, is not in politics in another two years, what happens mm -hmm. then? Right. It, so it, let me let me let me answer that now because it's something I'm very mindful of, right? Um, two things. One, even before this was launched, um, one of the things I, I took this to the Prime Minister as a smaller project. I commend Sean and Marsha, they supersize it, they upscale it with the whole thing with the curriculum and course and all of that. I was able to resubmit it and the prime minister loved it right away again she carried even further because she wanted no caribbean and she had some interest for people as far as ireland and so on that wanted to get this barbadian horsemanship and all these different things very exciting what let me know the government's serious about it is that it was actually everything don't get into the throne speech but this was in the throne speech before we was a republic and then it was in the state speech at the last opening of parliament so there's a record of this being there that's number one number two the national sports council is actually working on phase two in terms of the the funding the layout the structure and all that in terms of but they said that was a way bigger investment so that needs to be budgeted it needs to be, we went through covid we didn't have the elbow room to do it and it was just taking too long what I have been able to do is come a fast track that we get something off of the ground. So I don't want anybody to believe this is just a correlated thing. The fast tracking is part is, is, is really due to, to my, my doing. But this project is really embedded in the government programming already at the National Sports Council level. What I would do in my next two years that I, 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 I may or may not be here is to ensure that I keep advocacy to make it concrete. Then more importantly than it being the interest of somebody we have the opportunity now to demonstrate success build in the sustainability so that it is not a question of if we're doing this thing or not it would be established and therefore we use the success of the project to keep the momentum going whether i am here or not okay Marcia, so Leroy, I, I am not a stubborn person 
Contrary to not... popular belief. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief. Very so what popular I belief, know, by the way. I... Very popular belief. <laughs> Very popular belief. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am going to, let me, let me get your brain now that I have it. If we're working on the sustainability model, let's say we focus on hot walkers, exercise riders, jockeys in the first phase. Let's say we open it. How would I build in the sustainability with a hot walker and a groom? What does that look like? So like, I don't want to be unfair to anyone and their family, right? Remember that, you know, we're producing these individuals so that they can be exported, so that they can fulfill their familial needs, find work, that kind of thing. What does the sustainability model look like with a hot walker and a, and a, uh, a groom? Okay, all right. The reason why I was I was so animate about you reading that, this is, has nothing to do with the academy here. Right yeah. now, horse racing is hurting. If you hear Carlos Grant say how many horses that he has in his barn, how many groom, how many horses a groom has to take care of. And me and me as a horse person, I've been in this game for 44 years. Yeah. Seven horses per groom. I want to be very frank about what I have to say here. Those horses cannot be taken care of to the ex uh, to, to, to where you want them to be taken care of. Right. Yeah. So now again, this is nothing to do with, with the academy, mm -hmm. right? Please remember mm -hmm. this, right? Mm -hmm. This is more like throwing this at not just the minister himself, but I want this to go to the prime minister's head, not mm -hmm. to the minister. I want to go right to the top with this one. We are hurting so much in Canada for horses for horsemen right now. Mm -hmm that trainers are not a lot not a, can't bring the amount of horses they would like to bring to the barn if there's a hundred stalls just we just use a hundred the number 100 for just this at the at the at the woodbine racetrack we're only allowing allowing to get in at least 70 horses there's 30 horses out there that are now get, getting to come here as a jockey's agent there's say there's 70 jockeys in the room mm -hmm only 70 horses there's one jockey one per, per uh, one horse per jockey mm -hmm. that can't fill the races because the racing and ring will run with one jock with one horse one jock right? right just hear me out carefully here mm -hmm. right so we need those other 30 horses to help fill these races so because we don't have the people to do the job we can't get our races to go to the level we want them to go at to make things economically great so that our guys can send more money home to their families and stuff i want to know because right now last year i think and carlos you can correct me on this if i'm wrong we had to advertise our job for three months trainers had to advertise the job for three months before they can um start looking for work outside of canada this year they allowed them only one month to do that but the procedures that you have to go through, uh, Carlos, I need your help here if I'm going wrong here, please. The procedures they have to go through to get this paperwork done is so much. And it's like when we first came in the 80, 80 90s, we came on a, a contract. What's the chances for the government? I know Sean will say we need, we just can't send anybody up there. We need guys that are going to go up there and respect our country and do all the right things. But I'm just speaking for this moment to get things going. What can we do for the governments to get together from, you know, our prime minister get together with our prime minister in Canada and make something happen right now so that we can get something going and to help out even more? I'm just trying to set the foundation here to, to build a house. And Sean, if I'm going the wrong way, help me. Carlos, I'm doing the wrong thing. Tell, tell me here. Um, you're, you're saying the right thing, Leroy. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we're hurting. We're hurting. What, what what I can say is that is um Canada's moved the right way. They've made a serious investment into horse racing because it is an industry. There's no one particular. The, the jockeys are nothing without the hot walkers, without the grooms, without the trainers. So it is an industry, and the government should have a vested a vested. Um, they should have a serious investment within the industry. In Barbados, we have the Barbados Turf Club. So it's separated from the industry. I think 
government needs to put people on the on the turf club board, make it a from a boys club to a man's club, because there's so many different people depending on this. And we can't let take a personal decision for a whole industry to, to crumble. That would liaison with the Canadian government because they need the labor. Now, I've, I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world. When I'm in the United States, the Mexicans are the people who are the labor force. When I'm in Europe, when I'm in England, the Irish, the Irish are the labor force. When we in Barbados, we've always seen where the Guyanese or another country have been the labor force. And in Canada, when it comes to horse and horsemanship, the Bajans are the labor force or the Caribbean West, 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 West Indian, Indian. Caribbean people have been the labor force. So you can see where the industries tie and the governments need to realize it. We are no help without them and they're no help without us. You're absolutely correct. You know, like the, the, the grooms may not have a hot workers may not have the money to contribute, but their time is very, very, very valuable, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. On the other hand, he's got the money to contribute, but he ain't got the time. Yes. And I like I, I just want to say again, we are developing a horse racing high performance center. And Sean was very clear from the beginning. We will not call it a horse riding high performance center because he didn't only want to focus on jockeys. All right. I was trying to explain jockeys came into my language and maybe I started this whole thing. No, 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 no. Because <laughs> of the sustainability yeah. model that we're trying to build. So same thing with the West Indies Cricket High Performance Center. One of the things that we could have done better is that that one only focused on batsmen and bowlers. If you don't have somebody to roll and prepare the pitch, a groundsman, <laughs> you can't have a cricket match. So believe me when I tell you, you're preaching to the converted, right? It is just that when you think of getting this high performance center to function, as you say, Leroy, beyond a Corey Lane, beyond whichever government change, because let's let's be frank, we we again we live in Barbados, we know how this goes, right? The 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 grace of the government is with us now. When the government change, the next time it change, we want the High Performance Academy to be standing on its own two Correct. feet. Correct. Because if the government likes Correct. it, so be it. But if the government doesn't like it, it still stands on its own two feet. Correct. Right? Yes. And so that is why, for me, the sustainability model is so important. And not that we're not going to focus on all of the aspects of horse racing. But like cricket, the money that sustains the industry comes through the batsmen and the bowlers. The money that sustains the industry in horse racing comes through the jockey. The jockey. But I don't want you guys, I don't, I don't want you know you guys or the audience to take away that I am dismissing the no. industry. I'm very clear you. about how you. the industry is set up. Yeah. I am also, while I'm clear on that, clear about politics, how it works, and what I need to do to, to make sure that this uh, academy not only get started, but you know can stand on its own two feet in the shortest possible time. Um, so, Marcia, in the whole of Barbados, there are only two professional leagues. Two professional leagues: cricket and horse racing. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else that pays. I mean. I, I, I love circuit racing. I love, love, love circuit racing. But we've only had one youngster to go overseas to really see the whole dream through. And he's had tremendous push. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. it's really up to government to help push horse racing. Really, really up to government. It has gone past a passion, a personal passion. I, I personally feel, again, you're, you're preaching to the converted. I feel as though the government dropped the ball. And when I say government, that's not a, a party statement. I'm talking about governments, the, the people that have managed Barbados over time, have significantly dropped the ball with respect to horse racing in Barbados. 
right? There's a way in which, because I say to Sean Hall all the time, well, you're one of the celebrities in Barbados. And he looks at me and he's like, you mean me, Wes Hall's son? Like, how Wes Hall's son could be a celebrity, right? When you, when you live in the shadow of something, it is harder for you to see and understand yourself the way that other people see and understand you. And that metaphor of the Sean Hall, Wes Hall, is very much a metaphor of cricket and horse racing in Barbados. Horse racing has been in the shadow of cricket such that, you know, we have not really understood and appreciated the importance and the value of horse racing to our national imagination, um, to the, the industry that it has become, where we export several people, Leroy, you know, call the list and there's some people on the list unless it's that I don't know the Christian names because I don't know if Snake on that list like I said, I don't know if we, but, but there's a whole, no, like, you know, no, there's even more people writing. There are enough, 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 enough people who have made their living out of horse racing by moving from Barbados to Canada, right? Um, so we've dropped the ball. We, we, we absolutely have dropped the ball on this sport, and it is time for us. And we haven't even talked about the female, the, the female contribution, right? Right. You know, I can't leave here without putting that in. Um, so <laughs> so like we have dropped the ball and I'm really hoping that, you know, this initiative can rectify um, some of that. So, Marcia, so, excuse me, Marcia, um, no. how, how, how long would a person stay in the program before they could move on? OK, so how we have the program um, set up right now. We're looking at training an individual between, um, we want to start by, by June 1, 2024, and we want to take that into uh, April 1, 2025, with a view that that person then uh, makes their transition into Canada at that spring point when racing is starting back at Woodbine. So the program is just under a year of training. Um, one of the things that I'm, that I'm working on right now is actually um to overlay the, the curriculum of the horse racing high performance academy onto the barbados community college um curriculum so that they at least leave with a certificate, certificate right yes. that's a conversation um that we're having i'm not i'm not saying that we have the go ahead from bcc as yet because there is a process that has to happen um but I'm, I, I know what the process is. I've done it before. And so I don't anticipate that there should be, um, you know, too much uh, trouble with getting something like that done. So when they leave the center, they have their certification, they have their skills, and then we're actually working on placement um, or creating those placement opportunities so that they're moving um, directly from program uh, into action. So just under um, a year of training. Okay, but this I'm going back to the the government and involving work permits. Then, for instance, all right? Okay, so when these guys are done, because you know I see that it's more easier from for come from Barbados and go out west than to come to Woodbine with a jockey's license. And this is what I'm talking about, again, going back to about the government and trying to get something done to allow these guys easier, much easier access from Barbados to Canada with a work permit, and for instance. Yeah. Because yeah. the trainers have to go through so much protocol Leroy, now. Leroy, Leroy, I want to come yeah. in here. I want to come yes. in here because you mentioned this and it was really chomping at the bit. All funny thing they to, to really speak to this and some other things that were raised. And I, I really truly like to listen more than talk because I glad that I listened because like you spoke about the Guyanese in Barbados and the Irish in England. No, that was and, that was Kurt. That was Kurt speaking about that. Right, Kurt speak about that. It, it, but yeah. it is true. The same way Barbadians kept a lot of noise about Guyanese in Barbados at one point. It's really the Canadians that kept a lot of noise. And as far back in twenty sixteen, I think it was Sean who raised it with me. And he raised it with the then Minister of Foreign Affairs, Maxine McLean, who met with her counterpart in Canada and, and somewhat corrected the issue, albeit temporary. Now, Sean has raised this with me, and I, I have to sit down and raise it with the Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs so that we can have some kind of bilateral agreement set up so it's, it's structured and it's long term. 
that that's what needs to happen here with the, with the relationship between our prime minister and the prime minister in canada i believe that it should not be a problem whatsoever and that is something that just needs to be done it needs to be done it'd be done at the talking heads of the prime minister and then it would be put in the formal arrangement with the minister of foreign affairs and any ministers of labor that's how it was done in 2016 um, but then it wasn't. Uh, it was mainly more discussion. I'm not a formal arrangement. We go for a formal arrangement on this occasion. I think that needs to happen. I, I am very happy about what you said. Where or, or when someone said uh, at first you had to advertise for three months, yes, and then they brought it down to a month, and that means that they understand the need, and it is not yes. that we are coming to take uh, work from Canadians, but we are no. actually coming to offer something that is in, in shortage. And therefore, yes. it should be less of a problem. As as Marcia said, and I agree, the governments have really dropped the ball on horse racing. And someone mentioned something that I was there in the background cheering. I it was my my iPad died. I switched over to my phone, right? But I was in the background cheering because when you when someone mentioned about putting somebody on the Barbados Turf Club, what was happening is that person hit the nail on the head. The Barbados Turf Club is an old boys' club. And it was just seen as something that the, the sport of kings and the rich people get involved and the government keep itself out of it. And there's, so there's no regulation, there's no contribution, there's no understanding of it. But it really, the, the, the fact of the matter is, though, is the Leroy's, the Carlos, the Kirk's, the Sean's, and those who really have to advocate for the position, even if I'm a conduit or anybody else is a conduit to the people that need to make the decision. Because the reality is, the, the last set of ministers of sports, and understand that the Ministry of Sports is kind of side ministry within a ministry. And then horse racing is a side sport inside of the side ministry, side of ministry sport. You get where you're coming from. So there's yes. a lot of layers to it. Every in football, every cricket, in basketball is not even seen by the Ministry of Sports. And the Ministry of Sports is not even seen. That, that That's wow. just how it is. It's not a main ministry. But if wow. I believe that those on this call and others, those who have an interest in this thing, have to be at the forefront of advocating for it. Even when you talk about the work permits and what's needed in Canada, to be quite frank, I don't believe that the Minister of Labour or the Minister of Foreign Affairs is aware of this. They will not even know where to start in terms wow. of negotiation or the discussion. It has wow. to come from the persons in the industry advocating and saying this is the position, this is what is needed to give them the ammunition to go up there and make these things possible. I believe that that is what needs to happen. And I mean, offer this call even we can even take it further. That is my well, well and, and Minister, I mean, it, it's it's we're hurting. It. They're hurting very bad. And you know, do so. So you're saying? Sorry, I don't mean to. I, you're saying that the 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 the, the, the Minister of Sports doesn't even understand how much great we're talking about jockeys that Barbados has right now, not just produce have right now riding in North America. I believe that if you mention it to him and tell him about, uh, uh, again, a Patrick Husbands, he may, and I'm not personalizing it, I talk about generally the ministers of sports have not been very um, engaged in what we consider the side sports. You understand, like, there's some sports that just are not on the radar in the mainstream sporting. For instance, we are looking at a national sports policy here recently, right? And one of my contributions would be that they should really include all sports. Even if you say like, we can focus on six sports and there can be some kind of focus, the policy should be inclusive of all, even if you focus on some. But let us admit that cricket, football, basketball are the main sports, and then road tennis is the indigenous sports, and there's some push be be behind those. But when you think about squash and badminton and rugby and horse racing and even cow racing, there isn't that much input. But what I'm saying is that each person has to lobby for their particular thing because do not expect that a minister of sports, whoever it is, becoming minister of sports makes you, um, you know, a giant in all sports or interest in all sports. It just doesn't happen that way. Now, when you trickle down beyond the policy at the ministerial level and you go to an agency like the National Sports Council, you should have a chairman and a director who has a setup and a system that treats the all sports. But I don't even believe that that is the case. But let's forget the other sports. Right now we're talking horse racing. And if you want horse racing to progress in Barbados and you want the things that you're asking for, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So I'm asking <laughs> that those on this call and those in earshot start squeaking. 
that that is that is what I'm saying right now, and I'm, I hope that I'm bringing it both as clear as possible. <laughs> aye, aye, Captain. Got gotcha. you. Right. So, because I, I mean, it's so important that they understand how much youngsters got, can get taken off the street from doing the wrong thing and going the wrong way to go in the right direction because of horse racing. Because it's done that for me, yeah. and it's done that for me 44 years ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and there's so much more youngsters out there would love to be where I am, where Carlos is, and so on and so on. So, let's keep squeaking then. Not, not, not only that, Leroy. Right. Um, yeah. From the perspective of, of bringing in foreign exchange, mm -hmm. correct. The Cotspur Gold Cup mm -hmm. is not the only race we have in Barbados. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, same the thing Sandy for Lane, the Sandy Lane Gold Cup. Don't disrespect me. Uh, I Sandy. keep I keep calling okay. it. <laughs> I know you like the rap. <laughs> yeah, the Gold Dirty, Cup. Like the <laughs> Gold Cup brings in so much foreign exchange. So the minister is talking about a squeaky wheel, right? Yeah. But the initiative should come. Barbados, we don't. Sugarcane is not our best exporter. Our best, our best foreign exchange earner right now is tourism. Mm. And we need to do things to bring people to come to Barbados. The initiative should be understood these sports, these side sports, what what good they can bring to the foreign exchange pockets. It's all right to say we should keep noise, but I the, the the true understanding needs to come from up top. If the head bad, the body bad. That that's I, I've always heard that. So the initiative should come, the train of thought should be, oh um what in Barbados, what sport in Barbados can we push to bring in foreign exchange? Without a doubt, you can close your eyes and, and invest in horse racing. Close your eyes and invest in horse nah. racing. I I, um, I think the, the they they have they have to be made to understand the automatic understanding will not be there. And when they say the squeak, I don't keep in noise. I don't no, no. Uh, putting your proposal and making sure people understand the proposals on put the ideas put the requests you get recommend mm. that that to me on until and unless that is done i don't think we will go anywhere with this as i said the tradition has been the the barrier turf club is all and let me let me point some other adjectives an old rich boys club right they they got mm. it covered then you handle it yourself you don't see any input let me ask sean sean is on the ground mm. more than me let me say at the garrison right Sean, do, do you get the understanding that the ministries of sports have an understanding for horse no. racing generally outside of coming and presenting the Gold Cup once a year? No, sir. Not at all. And at all. speaking to, I mean, as you know, I've spoken now to four different ministers of sport. And mm -hmm. each of them was a different experience every time. You know what I mean? I must yep. admit white Sullivan was very interested on what we were doing i mean he brought me into zoom meeting yeah, he was very keen very 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 yes keen. yes he was very keen and then he got changed you know and that was the problem every time you change a minister mm -hmm. then it's felt like we got put to the bottom of the barrel you know what i mean to fight our way back to the top again you feel like you're starting over all over again you know and um it, it's just I mean, even back in the, my father was the Minister of Tourism of, of Sports at the time when we first came to Canada, and that was back in 89. And even then, that was like, like almost like going to the moon, you know what I mean? Walking <laughs> on the moon for the first time, because that was the first time the experience ever happened, you know? And the only good thing about it is, is that the door has been open since then where Barbians have been coming and coming and coming. It, it never closed. You know, it never closed. Yes, it closed. I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm trying to like from 91 to 97, I think it was, right? Yes, that's when we were allowed to come back up again in 98. But, you know what I mean? Barbians have just kept coming. I'm doing well. Our, our, our people are doing well. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter where, where part of the business they are they're working in. It could be the starting gates, 
you know what I mean? It could be a vet tech. It could be anything. But listen, Leroy, Leroy, Sean, let me let me let me add on this here now that you said that. Leroy, yeah. to even prove my point, recently, as 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 recent as about three weeks ago, it was about three weeks ago you had a meeting with the Minister of Sport, Sean. Yeah. Three weeks, yeah. Three weeks ago there was this meeting about this particular project, right? I had spoken in passing to the minister. I had sent him the proposal. I don't even know if he got a chance to read it. Mm -hmm. So and they had a meeting on the proposal. There was some contrary proposals being offered as well, um, coming up to do other things. Just a school, a little smaller. So we are smaller. And the minister can really understand. And my director reported to me, because I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get to attend the meeting. But my director reported to me that that boy, Sean Hall, let me put it out here, sat down in this meeting so quietly, right? Said nothing. Just observed the meeting. And when and the meeting was going out a particular way, the ministry was going in a particular way. The minister was going in a particular way. And then that boy, Sean Hall, opened his mouth and changed the tide of the entire thing. You know what he did? He brought an understanding to the minister. An understanding that I probably in my own capacity could not bring. Because he is of the industry. So there's no automatic natural osmosis of understanding. It has to be done by somebody who knows and understands the industry. And I can speak to it and represent. Because he turned the meeting on, he, hey, and the, the minister said, look, 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 well, this is the project we're going in. This, this, it has to be this. If this has done it, you understand what we I mean? So that is even a practical example that happened just within the last three weeks. Three weeks ago. So that bears yes. up my point even more. Just like that, now we really see who's the brains behind the project. That, right? There's a difference right. between the brains behind the project and who writes up the project. See how easy that come out? <laughs> <laughs> the, thing about it, the thing about it, right, is that I've been speaking, I've spoken to so many different ministers now over 10, 11 years that it comes, it's nothing to me to talk about my passion the thing about what really my passion for this is, is that chance is a place that I made money. Leroy, you made money, Charles made money, all of us who have gone there. So it's only natural for me to want to see other people given the opportunity, you know what I mean? And that's what it's all about. It's all about having opportunities for the people of this country. But one thing I can say, right? And where my passion would come from because something I, I let me give you the story to really see where my passion comes from when i was in australia in 1984 i was staying a friend of mine called greg hasten and he was telling me that he'd been trying to get my father to come to australia for the, the last 20 30 years to do this the talk circuit you know what I mean? Did a circuit in Canada, in um, Australia. He said, your dad would be a millionaire a thousand times over already because he speaks so well. So obviously I know there was no millions knocking around nowhere. So I said, I said, I said well, this is something I'm going to speak to where it's all about. But if you could have made millions, just growing book talking, can you stop pretty? I asked my father, daddy, how can you never come came to Australia to live to, you know what I mean? And my father told me this. My father told me, Sean, the reason why I never came to Australia is that I choose to go a different life. I choose to give back to my country. My country has given me so much that I choose to give back to Barbados any way I can. And when Marsha came to me, right, and told me that guys let me come back to this country and don't give back. She touched a nerve. You know what I mean? It, it was to me so because my father told me that he, you know what I mean? But Marcia aggressively told me so. You know what I mean? Really wiped me down, mashed me down. And I was almost embarrassed because I made up my mind that I was in my career in Canada was over because of my injuries and that kind of stuff. And I didn't want to start back in Barbados because I know how the environment is there. But I didn't have to say that, you know what I mean? Doing something to help people is bigger than me or anybody else. My father has done it. That's what halls do. And I 
kept with this for the last 11 years. Marsh says, keep telling me, Sean, you're brave, boy. You're brave to keep all of this stay here. It's it always ever flogging a dead horse, right? So anytime I get to speak to any minister in government, I raise the occasion and I bring up my passion for the industry. You know what I mean? I bring out what I went to Canada in 19, when I went back in 1997, 98, 98. And two years later, I bought my house. Okay? Two years later. I just, in two years, I could stay at Barbara 20 years. I can't even buy a bicycle. You understand? So things like that, given that passion that we have to get our people to the, to the next level of, um, of life, of, of doing well in life, and that's what it is really. So, yes, thanks, Minister, for, for saying that just now, because, yes, but the reason is, I, I really, it's not about Sean Hall, it's about the people of this country getting to get out. I always say I use Barbados as the, the starting startup of, of, of life, you know what I mean? Start your life here, but we could go on and do other things. I, I must also mention too, there's a gentleman by the name of Walter Eady. Walter Eady has also given me a lot of, um, Walter Eady watches our show every week. And he said that, at watching our show every week is like Leroy and myself taking him to university. And we go to different universities every week. Because everybody knows myself and Leroy are not very far from any kind of, Marsha Hines type of university. But we are, our, our university is Woodbine, Fort Erie, Barbados, Garrison, Savannah. You know, I mean, wherever I went to deal with horses, I've been to the University of Madras, Calcutta. You know what I mean? The, the uh, Gold Coast in, in, in Australia, Mount Barker. Everywhere I went, I was like a sponge and I tried to absorb everything I, I, I learned and, you know what I mean? No, I think we must give opportunities to younger Barbadians to do the same. Well said, man. Well said, all. Well said. I back what you just said 100%. And talking about giving back, and that's one thing that I like, I admire with Patrick. And I'm Patrick, I've been going, Patrick, this is going to be seven years, I've been going to be Patrick's agent. And never in this world, that little guy that was out of school at 15 years old, in horse racing for 44 years, never in my life I ever think I would be the agent of one of the greatest jockeys that ever leave the, 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 the island of Barbados. And I am proudly to say that I am his agent. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? And what he, his passion for the game, like presently we're in Florida. I'm in the same place as him. And that boy can't sleep because of the horse racing. That's, I mean, his passion, it, it, it I, I don't know how the word to say, Marsh, if you can find a word for me, <laughs> his passion, it, it oozes something and it, it's unbelievable. So, and I know how, how passionate I am also, but my passion is not as close as where his is. And I mean, to get up in the morning and to wake him up and more or less go get in that car and we drive almost an hour to go get on horses about palmettos at another place or get up and go where we're right we are costume here or to him to get on a racehorse at the taco so that passion for the game and i want to speak about because i know this is about jockeys and stuff like that and carlos talked about you have to have that passion more than have that passion brother you yeah have you have to more passion. than have that passion you know what passion mean? And, it was nine years old and we get up we get up and i mean i got all my papers here my condition books here this this it you gotta have something and we Barbadians have it. I mean, I've been around these guys, a lot of these guys, and you know, that passion it just oozes from us. And then so to I don't want to. It's not my intention to like bring all the the trade secrets out of the school, but just to again give you um, a sense of some of the things that we're doing to generate that passion to make sure that when we send um, or finish product to Canada, you know, some of what we're doing to make sure that they can cope, right? Yeah. So when you're building a high-performance athlete, so anybody can have horse racing talent, 
Yeah. Technically, anybody, you know, there are a number, like I said, of, of uh, you know, young people around the garrison and we see it every day. They're excellent at what they do. They, they help with that legacy of, of horse racing. By the time you're developing a high performance athlete, though, you want to check to make sure that that individual has the medical soundness to be a high performance athlete, right? So the individuals that, we're, that we want to offer places to in the um, center, they are going to be fully worked up medically so that we know that, you know, when we start to train this individual, this is an individual that we can take through to a high performance level. Um, we have uh, an individual who will be working with the medical team to develop exercise plans for each individual. So you may have someone, and, and Sean was explaining this the other day, who is brilliant on a horse, but who doesn't have upper body strength can become a high performance athlete, right? Because you need upper body strength to properly ride a horse and to compete against the field successfully. So we're gonna work with the medical practitioner, work with the exercise uh, practitioner to be able to develop individual schedules for each child. Um, I guess everybody knows I'm, I'm, I'm not an easy person to impress. Um, there is one other individual that I know in Barbados who is, is well-trained and has experience in teaching um, neurodivergent learners. Her name is Brunella Keynes Hall. Um, and we have been talking to Ms. Keynes Hall about using her expertise to develop the, the educational or to deliver the educational component of the program. All I want you to understand, we I am at the University of Guelph, um, as you know. We're also developing a part of, of this experience for the for the children. Uh, for the, I'm calling them children because I'm so accustomed to, to classroom, I'm sorry, for our clients. Um, we are going to bring our cohort to the University of Guelph and have them see the vet clinic here because there is a connection between Woodbine and the University of Guelph in relation to caring for horses, right? And as you said, Leroy, hopefully this lets you know that I'm not only thinking about the jockey aspect of, of the thing, but we want, we want our, our clients to understand where the horses go when they get sick. What happens on that end? All of that makes you become a more compassionate individual on the horse, which is good for the jockey and good for the horse. So these are some of the things that, that we have built into this program. You don't want a high performance athlete who is coming to Canada for the first time to perform, who feels the call of Canada that first time. You want them to know the difference between a spring jacket and a winter jacket, like a whole set of things that that Sean, you know, has been able to to build into this program because of his experience. Right. You want an individual. You guys know when you came to Canada in the 80s, you were getting cash Ain't nobody paying you in cash around Woodbine anymore. I mean, Carlos can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you uh -huh. don't have a bank account. When we, when we first came here, Marsha, we came here with the Barbados government. Okay. We came here okay. With the so, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to open an, a bank account. A bank you account, have to be yes. able to do that. Exactly. These are skills. Our, hyper, our athletes should not be going to Canada and then having to butt around to figure out how to do these things. Right. So all of that is is kind of like what we're building into our product so that when people step into Canada as a high performance athlete, they're just ready to go. They're ready to go. That's the level that we have to train them at. And that's, you know, some of the things that we're committed to doing. Like I said, I'm not giving away all my trade secrets, but just to say that, you know, we through Sean's experience and through, you know, his his expertise of having done this. I think we've covered um, a lot of the bases um, that can make us even more prominent um, as horse racing people, not just jockeys, horse racing people um, in the Canadian context.
<laughs> okay, all right, we're almost two hours into this, and I mean, and you know, but so when is this? Uh, can you guys let us know when is this thing supposed to start, and how can you get in, in touch of people in it and so on before we get shut off this here? We're into two hours now. Right. So the hypo, the Caribbean Horse Racing High Performance um, Center, um, as we said, we're hoping to have our first cohort in by June 1st um, and the program, uh, you know, rolling out then. Um, in terms of people wanting to get uh, in contact with us, I think the best way to do that would be through yourself, Leroy, through Sean. Um, we are, you know, busy setting up all of our paperwork and, and making sure that our entity is a legal entity. Because again, if we're asking our young athletes to aspire to that standard, we also, as the people who are coordinating the effort, have to rise to that standard, right? Um, as you rightly said, if you have uh, high performance athletes outside of Canada contributing to charity, um, you know, they may be able to get tax breaks, but that means that, you know, we have to be set up in the right way and that kind of thing. And so we're making sure that we have all of that in place so that anybody in the diaspora, and I'm really asking the diaspora, I know that Leroy is going to talk to me after this show about sponsoring two grooms. I am, I'm here for that. Um, so we want the diaspora to be able to come forward and to help with this project because we know that our country needs that support, right? It's, it's you know, a part of my give back too to be involved in this because the truth is in, in the academy with what I'm doing now, I've moved on from, from you know, high performance centers and sports people, but wherever they're, they're young Bajans that I can support through my expertise and knowledge, I will do that. Um, that's the give back. That's what we have to do for a small little island that, that has given all of us a shot. And so we're really asking the diaspora um, to support this project and to help us. And it doesn't only have to be money. We need saddles. Um, there's a whole set of equipment um, that we're going to need. And so, you know, we're asking people to really come on board um, and to help us. Well said. Okay. All right. Minister, well, you have anything else to add? It's, it's, his mic is, is mute, so I probably take talking and can't hear him. Yeah, I can okay. I can hear you guys. I can okay. hear you guys. Anything else you okay. like to ask before we go, sir? No, I just think I want to emphasize the point in terms of having um, the the persons on this call continue to understand that the, the project is a, a holistic a partnership. And I think that even if Marsha is leading a part of it, Sean is leading a part of it, I'm trying to mobilize um, support, governmental resources and other ways that everyone has a part to play. I, I believe in uh, a whole society approach to a lot of the things that we are trying to do. And I think that a lot of times people have been left out or people like to sit on the sidelines. And I just calling on everyone that has an interest in this to find out how you could play your part. The last question, one of the last questions that was asked um, tells me and indicates to me that people are willing to play their part when you ask how soon this thing starting and how can we get people in it. It means that you're already thinking about how you can, you can understand that you will be a part of this project is um, a, 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 a whole industry project and that everyone can be involved in one way or the other, whether it is, is taking uh, persons that are certified, um, allowing us to do tours, people come up, be part of the training, whether it be online or whatever. I think that there's a role and a part of play for everyone. And yes, that's what we want people to go away with. It would be like an overview of responsibilities kind of thing like? Right, I'm sure that I am sure that that would be that would be um, put out there. Um, but I just mean in terms of from even just the the mental understanding that this this is our thing. This is a, the horse racing industry thing, and everybody can play a part. Perfect. Like you, like Marshall say, it takes a village to raise a child, so we need Correct. a village. Correct. All right, Correct. gotcha. All right, guys. Well, I don't think Thank there's. You. Thank you very much for for, for coming, sir. I really appreciate your words, and um, I really looking looking forward to working. With you. Now, this will be a success. I, I have no words for that. Mark. You are brilliant. Thank you so much for all the help, all the years. <laughs>
Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you as Marge for sticking it out. Uh, <laughs> being being uh, brave and persistent. And I think that we, we shall overcome and we shall see the top right. team they talk. Yeah. So thank you and good night. Thank you for having me. Right. And thank, thank you, you everyone for the con excellent contributions that they've made and made my mind even clearer about mm -hmm. why we are doing this. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. All right, All right guys. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming, listening to us. Um, this was brilliant. We, we, we've explained it as much as we can, and um, a lot more will be said in the months to come. Right, Marsha? For sure. All right. And on that note, Sean. Yes. Well, we're, we're out of here. Out of here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's All right. Journeys is sponsored by the Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association of Ontario, which represents thoroughbred owners and trainers and their hardworking employees at Woodbine and Fort Erie racetracks. The HPPA represents horse people's interests in all issues pertaining to thoroughbred racing. The HPPA's goal is for the betterment of racing at all levels, from medical and pension plans to negotiating with government and racetrack operators. Your HBPA is at the forefront of all issues important to members. Please visit the HBPA at hbpa.on.ca or on social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thank you, HBPA Ontario. Away Together is all about enhancing the guest experience from the hotel to exploring everything the destination has to offer. Away Together brings the culture and the history of a location alive to the traveler who is seeking to immerse themselves in a truly authentic local experience while on vacation. The next race day at the Garza Savannah will be the 30th of April. Bring your family and enjoy.